there'll be a short uh, section at the end for questions. So if we could just keep our questions till the end. Um, and then also I would like to, before we get started with Bruce, I'd like to introduce um, Brandy. She has come on board to sort of help um, support because the topics we're talking about are pretty intense. Um, so yeah, if Brandy would like to introduce herself. Okay, everybody. Uh, my name is Brandy, like mentioned. Um, I am, I've lived in um, Okinsis my whole life. I'm here just as a professional role. I'm a therapist in the community um, and actually just work primarily with Indigenous folks surrounding these topics. And so if it's a way that I can provide space for people, um, if you're feeling triggered or feeling like you want to debrief or talk about anything, you're more than welcome to send me a direct message here on the chat. So you can see I'm Brandy. Um, and then we can kind of go from there to see if you'd like to just chat there, um, or we can look into a phone call or a video call, something like that, uh, whatever level of support you feel like uh, might be helpful for you. So thank you for having me. Thank you. Um, so I guess quick intro, intros of the um, cultural instigators from the Bring in Power to Truth program. Um, I'll start, my name is Riel Minuans. I'm from Sutina Nation. I work on Sutin Nation as a youth program coordinator. I also do different work in the city of Calgary with the city of Calgary um, guiding circle. And I'm on the board of the MST Performance Art. Um, yeah, I'll keep it short. If, I guess I'll, I'll let Kelly introduce herself. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Riel. Uh, okay. Nistuni uh, Donagopukaki. My name is Kelly Mortonville. My Blackfoot name is Little Woman. I'm originally from the Bigani First Nation, which is about two and a half hours south of Calgary. Uh, I work at the Calgary Public Library as the Indigenous Service Design Lead. Um, and I'm also the chair of Making Treaty 7 and the secretary of N Media uh, Gallery and Production Society. So thank you and welcome. I'll pass it off to Jared. Oh, I'm Boston. Oh, um... My name is Sarah Kingman. I'm from Morley and I'm still in Dakota. Uh, recently, I think Morley changed to Minithni. And so now we call it Minithni, apparently. So, which is good. And yes, I, I'm a film director and I am a mentor of Nakoda, co founder of Nakoda AV Club and a mentor for the youth. And yeah, and I'll pass it on to Jared Sates. Good afternoon, everyone. Um... Uh, my name is Jared Tailfeathers, also known as Colleen Crane. Uh, my dad is from the Blood Reserve, the Blood Tribe, uh, down in southern Alberta. Um, I am also a practicing artist, um, a multidisciplinary artist, a musician, author, and inventor. Uh, and currently, I am uh, mostly a stay-at-home dad, so I'm, I'm glad that we get to uh, get to do this today. I'll, I'll mostly be off camera and, and mute because uh, my, my daughter is teething right now. So uh, thanks for coming. It's really important that you're all here. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to hand it off to um, our special guests. Uh, we have Autumn Eagle speaker, Wendy Walker, and Yvonne Henderson, who are a group of Indigenous women, activists, and leaders within the city of Calgary, um, also Treaty 7, and have been doing a lot of work. Um, I know, particularly back to Idle No More Days um, and have been working with um, currently the City of Calgary and the Children's Memorial Monument that sits at City Hall. So I'm going to give them an opportunity to introduce themselves and then we will pass it off to Bruce to, to open up her circle. So I will pass it off to Autumn. Okay, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Nidanika Wat with Kupiksaki. My name is Autumn Eagle Speaker. Um, my family is from the Blood Reserve, which is two and a half hours south of here of Calgary. Um, that's where my mom is from. And my dad is African American from San Francisco and Georgia. Um, and so I lived in Calgary for the past 27, 28 years. Um, as Kelly had mentioned, I'm one of many grassroots activists that have been involved with the Shoe Memorial campaign that has been taking place at City Hall. Um, and and um, my history as an activist, I have been involved with um, movements such as uh, helping to lead I Don't Know More Calgary um, as one of the um, leads for Walking With Our Sisters Calgary, which was the 
um, Moxon Vamp Memorial for um, 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 murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls and two spirit relatives, um, which took place at Mount Royal about four years ago. Um, and in, just in that time, um, just been involved with like lots of other little um, initiatives um, and have just recently had the pleasure of being able to speak um, in a larger, uh, you know, area at, with TEDxYYC. Um, just to add some conversation around, um, I use that as a platform to discuss residential schools um, and its ongoing legacy of intergenerational trauma. Um, so, and when I'm not doing that, um, I also run um, an indig indigenous craft market, uh, which is called Authentically Indigenous uh, with my sister, um, which is now in our seventh year. And I also do cultural event programming. Thank you for having me. Uh, Wendy, would you like to go? Okay, Danita Ambawastach Tanse. Um, I almost said good morning. So I'm a, I'm a little bit tired. I was counting ballots um, last night till quite late um, for the federal election. So a little burnt out today. Uh, I've made Mokinsis my home for over 40 years. I've raised a family here. Uh, originally, I'm from Winnipeg, Manitoba. My mother is Cree Métis and my father is Mi'kmaq First Nations from Nova Scotia. I used to make this really corny joke and I used to say that my brother, my sister and I were the original M&Ms before the candy came out. <laughs> it's a, I'm really corny, but it's the only joke I got and comedy is not my thing. Um, I work in the arts and have been a singer, songwriter, performance artist for over 30, no, I think it's next year I have a 30 year anniversary um, in doing that and and um, and uh, choosing uh, as, as an Indigenous woman to not ever take what I do into bars and places like that and to um, um, so it was it was tough 30 years ago starting out there wasn't a lot of work for us. And uh, women uh, who were there with me at that time is she Donovan who has passed away and uh, oh my gosh I just lost her name. Oh, I can't believe I'm so embarrassed, um, you know, helped open doors for other Indigenous artists um, and broke down uh, barriers. Um, so I've been involved in activist events uh, for over 50 years, um, but most notably here uh, in Mokinsis with um, Occupy Calgary, I helped organize the march and uh, uh, set up the initial tent city at Olympic Plaza and uh, helped kind of keep that going for a bit. Also was very honored to be uh, one of the women included in the original four Idol No More organizers for Calgary, uh, which was Autumn Eagle Speaker, Summer Stonechild, Kim Weaselfat, and myself. And um, so I'm very proud of some of that work. And uh, as a survivor, my father went to residential school, my mother was in a sanitarium and uh, there was, it was not very good for her. Um, I bear a lot of that scars and a lot of that intergenerational trauma and I do the best I can with what I have and, um, and just uh, here to hopefully make a difference and leave a legacy that is uh, better for the next generation that is coming along. I'm grateful to be here and uh, thank you for the invite and um, I guess it'll be over to Yvonne now. Next day. Good morning. Um Oki Nitaniku Books Kaneskina Nakiaki. I hope I said that right. <laughs> um, my name is Yvonne Henderson and I lived and grew up in Mokinsis my whole life. I am from the Siksika Nation and I love being a part of Treaty 7. Not a lot about me because I learned long ago, like I'm just a regular girl. <laughs> I'm just one of many women in the community that are helping put this shoe memorial together. And um, I'm a part of the Bear Clan Patrol. I'm one of the original seven co-founders of the Bear Clan Patrol Calgary. And I'm, yeah, I'm just here helping and lending my voice and helping out. And it's an honor to have me here. So thank you so much. If I go off camera, it's just because someone's coming to my door. But thank you so much. All right, thank you for those introductions. Um, so we were, I'm honored to present Bruce Starlight. Um, he is an elder from Sutina Nation. Um, he works a lot with our youth program. He's one of our 
main elders that we always um, approach with tobacco to gain knowledge, to help keep our ceremonies alive. He's a language commissioner. Um, he holds many titles. Um, we invited him here today. We invited him here today um, to talk about his knowledge and experience with treaties, um, you know, settler government, indigenous relations, um, you know, why it's important that we honor the treaties, understand them, and sort of like government responsibilities with the residential school findings and um, like what's what's next steps is why we invited him. So I would like him also to honor us with a prayer to open up and to start this in a good way. Thank you. So you all know we've lost a lot of people in all our communities. And that's how I'm going to pray. And uh, I just finished a prayer for one of our, our people here this morning. And everyone is, uh, everyone I've been to where I've been asked to pray, it's all sad. And it, what, what adds to it is a pandemic. So help me pray, all of you. And if anything's going to keep you going, it's creator and prayer. And today, that's why we're here. It's because our people never gave up on prayer. It's like a katanan yes and a anis to say, Tito tatis le. Ata kuti tlaha atite tite nati tsilinis. No hot dark all these people here today to listen to me with an open heart not <clears throat> so I'll just uh, get into the uh, discussion at hand. <clears throat> First of all, you know what uh, I'd like to start off with is uh, there's really no one today that uh, is actually 100% into our treaties. People talk about it, people are aware of it, but our voices are silent for whatever reason. It's not a priority like it was with when my dad was a chief, when I was younger, and all the chiefs that I know right up until maybe the 70s, and then it just quit. But before that, I used to attend meetings up north and, and you know, whenever they have these gatherings with the Indian Association. And then the old people, they used to, right away, they used to talk about treaty rights. And they didn't care. They just talked Cree, they just talked Blackfoot, they just talked Stony. And it was up to us to try and find the translations. But that was sovereignty. Those were sovereign acts of those people that I remember. And some of them, they talk Stony, Cree, and then they start talking English. So I guess I grew up in an amazing time when the, we had real fighters for leaders. 
people who would stand up to the government and say, no, I have a treaty. Not, yeah, I have a treaty, well, let's compromise. That's a, the way you hear chiefs today. So I'm really concerned about our future with these treaties. So if any chief is upset, you know, it's okay. Let them talk to me. So anyway, that's, uh, that's how I feel about this, our treaties. And to us, before, before, the, before contact, we had treaties amongst each other. And those treaties were like the pagan and the bloods, the Kootenays and the, the Shoshone bandit would ask them, we'd like to cross your land to use the head smashed in buffalo jump. So they, they make a treaty and they, they actually pay a tariff and then the bloods tell them or the pagans, you've got so many days to come in and get what you want, but after that you have to leave. So those were peace treaties. Not they call it in Sutinna. And so it was our understanding when we entered into this treaty and the pipe, the, our pipes were always there. They, they smoked on a pipe. And then if anyone didn't, didn't agree, he won't take the pipe, he just lets it pass. And when it comes time to speak, the one that didn't smoke stands up and then he says his piece, he sits down and then he smokes if he wants the next round. So when Treaty 7 was signed, our pipes were there. And so the Blackfoot, I don't know if they got their the Treaty 7 pipe back, but they found it and they were trying to get it back as far as I know last fall. In every major event, there's a song. You're supposed to have a song so that you can associate that event with a song. And again, the Blackfoot have that song. So before treaty, we signed treaty 1877. So Canada became a country 1867. And they were already signing some of the treaties in the East with the, the, in the Huron Robinson treaties and others before the number treaties. And then when they signed, those tribes that were signing treaties, they told the commissioners, what about our brothers to the setting sun? And then the commissioners told them, we'll treat you the same. So it went on and then a lot of, well, you know, the government, the way they are even today with us, they've done a lot of crooked things. They developed the Indian Act. They, uh, they sold the Rupert's land that was from Manitoba right up to the, to the Alberta. And I think into the territories, they sold that, the Hudson Bay sold that to the Crown. And it's called a Rupert's land. And as I understand it, there was a case that was supposed to go to court on the Rupert's land claim. So they sold the land before they even signed Treaty 7. So in the treaty, because our pipes was there, it, it, it the four elements, the natural elements, earth, fire, wind, and uh, earth, the, anyway, the four elements were there, water. 
So the wood and the stone was the was the earth. And then the inhaling was the water because your spittle comes out on. Fire was lighting the, the pipe. And so in the air was what you breathe in. So the elements, the four natural elements were always there when they made peace. So when, before we light a pipe, you can joke around, you know, crazy, say crazy things and all that. But once you light the pipe, it's that's when it becomes more solemn and it's between you and creator. And when I was growing up, one of the main things we were told was don't lie because the bear and the rocks are going to hear you anyway and the ghost. So that was one of the main things we were told is don't lie. So when we smoked the pipe and then we saw the white man smoke the pipe, we thought, as they said, as long as the sun shines, the river flows and the grass grows, that it was forever in perpetuity in, in modern terms. So it was forever. It was an agreement forever. But no longer, no, as soon as we signed, they started to break the treaty. Our treaty, Treaty 7, was from the headwaters of the of the Bow River right to Cypress Hills, three to six miles on each side. And then when we signed treaty, we should have kept those lands. But each one of us, they made us believe that, you know, that the land was too big and, you know, we'd never settle in those areas. The Blackfoot, I don't know about the Pagan and the Bloods. They have pieces of land all over the place that they kept. And some of it is still there. I think it's maybe the, they start destroying the, uh, the land maps. Like the, the Tsutina. I'm going to be talking all over the place. The Tsutina, this old man, they're both gone. Narcisse pipes them. And Sam Simon, they used to, they, they came from Hobima. And they used to go up on the west of our community. And they used to work for the farmers up there, the ranchers. And they said, we found pins, quarter mile pins outside of the reserve on the, west, on the west side. And so our forest area was supposed to be Moose Mountain. And uh, we have stories of the Moose Mountain, how, you know, how we got our holy headdress. So as time went on, the, the promises were starting to be broken. And John A. MacDonald, if you ever, if you ever read about him, you know, he it, it tells you, you know, that he he meant to destroy us as a people. Some of the writings from the Indian agents and over the years, the RG-10 files, they were talking about some of our people in the plains that were starving. And some of the letters that went back to the, to the Indian agents, just, oh, just let them starve. A lot of our soldiers that went to the First and Second World War joined only because there was so much hunger in the communities. 
So we promise not to make war anymore once we sign treaties. And so we still today, we still keep that. But them over and over, they, in one way or the other, they use force on us, like the, uh, the, the uh, standoff in the Mohawk in Ontario, and just recently in BC. And nobody sat down with the RCMP and told the RCMP, you were a treaty promise. You were supposed to protect us against incursion into our territories. The commissioner said, and the great white mother shall send her children to protect you. That was the Northwest Mounted Police. But no, what do they do? They protect the, they protect the white man and his interests first. And you see it on TV with the people in Nova Scotia. Their own courts upheld treaty rights. And they're abusing the Mi'kmaq people in Nova Scotia today. And then when they when people are when the when other nations abuse people like the Chinese and the other people. When they abuse other people, they don't say anything. And look what they're doing right here in Canada. Like I said, I'm going to be talking all over the place. So UNDRIP, the United Nations for the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, the first draft right from the United Nations was okay. And then Canada got hold of it, and then they start to revise it. And I phoned Autumn to help me to fight. And so I'm still fighting it because it's a very dangerous document. And AFN supposed to, again, another body supposed to protect our rights, forced it through. And some of the chiefs in Treaty 1 and Treaty 2, they said, yeah, no, that's okay, we're, we're, we're for it. They didn't read it. Article 46, if you read the untrip, what was approved by Parliament, it, it said all these flowery things from 1 to 45. And then sec, Article 46, they just nullified everything. It says you can complain, not in a proactive fashion, but as a, you know, after the fact, you can complain. And then Willie Littlechild himself said, Canada doesn't have to listen to you. So we're sitting here calling ourselves First Nations. The United Nations doesn't recognize us as nations. Again, Willie Littlechild said that. What has to happen is a country in good standing with the UN has to sue Canada for us to become nations. So we talk about the treaties as if we're nations, and yet the United Nations doesn't recognize us as nations. So the three countries that were the holdout on the UNDRIP was Australia, the United States and Canada, because they were, because they were the other Australia and the United States, those nations were conquered, not us, we were never conquered. So that's why Canada was the last holdout because they had to find 
a way to deal with the the uh, the uh, the human rights of our people. So those kind of things that are are our own people were our own worst enemies at times. And people like Sex Potterface stands up, but our voices aren't being heard. Before, when the chiefs, the old guys spoke, everybody listened, everybody did what they, what they advised them to do, but not anymore. And we're so divided. So I don't see our treaties moving forward into the future because now everything they do, Canada and the provinces, is to limit the exercise of our treaty rights. The Sultana, we did not sign away our water rights. We told them no. When they gave us a settlement here on to fix up the Elbow River in Brad Creek, I told the council, do you remember not to give the water rights away? And they said, no, it's not included. So I don't know how many other communities signed their water rights away. But us, we own the part of the rivers that and the creeks that go through Chut Inna. And we own the groundwater. So those are the rights that treaty rights that you gotta you gotta go back and follow, see what happened in your communities. It's a hard fight because you know government today, they throw things at, at us. And they throw money and then we grab it and then all of a sudden we're, we're compromised. So why, why is it that we have to stay by the treaty? Because without the treaties, Canada, their hands are tied. They can never truly become a country without us, the First Nations treaty people. We stand in a way. 1930, the Natural Resources Transfer Agreement, they, they didn't tell us that they were going to give everything to, to the province. Again, a, a real bad treaty, uh, the abrogation of treaty. Our chief, Joe Big Plum, I don't know how he found out that they were talking about the, nat the Natural Resources Transfer Agreement in Lethbridge. So these two, two, he sent two suit in it to go down. And they went to the pagans. They stopped over at the pagans. And then, because they were, they were, they wanted to know what they were saying. So they started to go to Lethbridge. And then a telegram went to the Coldale RCMP saying that there's, there's people from the Tzut and the, the Pagan or, or, or left the reserve without permission or something like that. But they put him in jail. And we weren't allowed to have lawyers till the mid 1960s. And we, we, we had no legal representation we don't have at that time. And then they start changing the Indian Act in 1952. 
And that wiped out all our traditional leadership, that be the lifetime leadership and father to son leadership. I don't know if it was a good idea for lifetime. I don't know because I didn't live it. But I know that through the, through the lifetime leadership, our chiefs had a lot of respect from the people. And so what did we lose? We, lo we lost a lot. And then what, that's when they start defining, you know, the, the, our governments. In the treaties, it said, go, you can go ahead and continue the way you govern yourselves. We won't bother you. But now what are they doing? They're starting to define the rights of our chiefs and councils. And they're giving us money for self-government. And then in some of your self-government and your constitution, it says under section 25 and 35, Well, no, that's the first wrong thing you do is recognize Section 25 and 35. At the time when they repatriated the Constitution, the chiefs at that time, 1982, they said, no, it's your Constitution. We'll develop our own. So every time we put things in words, they grasp at it and then they meld it and mold it into what they want it to look like. So hunting and gathering, access to lands that are not, not that, how do you say, crown lands, now the ranchers that had crown leases won't let those leases go for Indian reserves. Expansion to Indian reserves. The last one I know was uh, Chief Robert Smallboy and Miss Kasu Cree. Chief Robert Smallboy, 1968, he moved into the mountains. And now the community they have levels of community, a hamlet, a village, municipality, city. I don't know what they designated that land as, but they got houses there now. And so the government stayed, stays silent on a lot of things that we take for granted is, is not, is not legislated. Hunting and gathering. We were supposed to continue our life of hunting and gathering. Like I said, in perpetuity. But now they limit it. If you kill a moose and you try to share it or try to trade for some, some other food items, they won't let you. And the eagles, they're not a dangerous species anymore, and yet they're charging our people. My cousin, an old lady from Morley, I think they, I think their fine was two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. And yeah, right there, the Stonies. They went to the house and they helped them. The police came in. They made sure they were Indian police, First Nation, from First Nations. And they made them clean out what she had, all the hides, feathers, everything. Holy objects, what we consider holy, they took it away. And the chief said nothing. So we're at our own. What do we do? What is that? What is our next great step we're going to take? 
a while back when I was in council. And then uh, Wallace Fox, there was an AFN meeting. So Wallace Fox from Onion Lake, he had a chief's meeting the same time as the AFN assembly. There was only 11 chiefs, 11 treaty chiefs from, from Northern BC, some of the territories, Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba, the number treaties. Only 11 chiefs. I was so disgusted. They went to AFN because they get more money over there for their meetings. So I just left. I said, there's no chiefs. And I'm not going to sit here and have someone vote by proxy. I'm going to go home. I said, I felt so sorry for that chief. And there was only him and Daryl Nipponak across the country that was fighting for treaty rights. You see, there's treaty and non-treaty. And of the 660 chiefs or more, there's only 220 treaty chiefs. So when these programs come out, they give it to those non-treaty people to make us, you know, jealous and talk about getting more funds for our program. But they do that intentionally. You talk to Pong Maker Reserve, they took part in the Real Rebellion. You talk to a guy called Eric Tetusis, he'll tell you right to this day the Canadian government doesn't help them as much as other tribes. So all this country that we have, it's all ours. And we've never, because it's a peace treaty, and we agreed to share, and that's what we're doing. And everybody talks about residential school. Yeah, that was, it was horrific. But it wasn't only the residential schools. The, you all know, you must know this, the, the girls, were only, there's only three professions, a, a nurse, nurse's aide, a teacher, and a nurse. If they wanted to take anything else, they had to give up their treaty rights. The boys, they were kicked out at 16. And they couldn't, they just, grade six was their ma maximum. You could go to grade eight, that was it. So where was the promise for all that education? Health, medicine chest, Treaty 7, it doesn't have it. Treaty 6 has it. And then the government said, you know, the, we'll, do, do, we'll include it in Treaty 7 and treat you like, like the, uh, like the, the, the Treaty six people. So that's how we got the medicine chest. And it should be, how you say, the medicine that we get is all generic. And it makes our people sick. Me, when I get a, when I get a, when I get a prescription, I go to the drugstore and I tell them I want the brand name. So that's, that's what I get and I pay the extra. 
All those things, that's, that's health, economic development. An oxen plow and cattle. And they never delivered on it. I think the blood's just settled theirs. And uh, others are still fighting for some of the things that were promised. And that, like I said before, the, the great white mother shall send her children to protect you. That's the police. You sh and the uh, Royal Proclamation, that wasn't a gift from Europe. Chief Pontiac was going, he told them, he told the British, he said, if you keep molesting my people, we're going to, we're going to drive you into the sea. So 1763, the Royal Proclamation. And it's just a few words that recognize our sovereignty, but it's there. So when we talk about our treaties, the treaties flow from the Royal Proclamation. Our rights flow from there. Those few words in the Royal Proclamation. So when we talk, why should we, why should we go back and make sure our treaties are, are safe? Because there are promises that were made that we haven't even started fighting for. And so it's like all these things that they've done, said Treaty 7 anyway, since 1877, it was to do away with our rights. It was to, it was to annihilate us. And they still do that today. One of the, and, and this uh, water, drinking water. My sister lives just a, not even a quarter mile from, from me. When she, when she has to, when she has to uh, use her, the water, she has to run the water for 45 minutes. And the water, her water, the water, when she first turns on the tap, it's orange. And you go buy, buy a case of water and you, you see how much it costs. And some of us can afford it. So all the things that were promised is, is, and then finally they made a big thing about uh, was it Pelican Narrows? Well, even that, in one of the reserves in Ontario, they hired this contractor, even though the First Nation was telling them, we'll build it ourselves. The government hired this contractor and it wasn't built to specs the way it was supposed to be built. And then they asked the contractor, he said it right on TV. He said, uh, well, the, those people get a lot of money, free money. So it, it's just like they, we don't deserve good water. So it's like the, uh, like in the territories, they're limiting the, the caribou. They're limiting them to, to uh, I think it's eight, eight caribou a year. Well, that's your livelihood. And then it's the government that's through with the uh, approval of the wells and the drilling and the mining of now of diamonds, that's limiting the caribou migrations through the Dene territories. 
So I don't know when we're going to wake up or if we're going to wake up. But it's all up to the younger people to spread the word, to go to the meetings or create the meetings and teach the younger people about treaties and tell their chiefs and councils to quit compromising the articles of those treaties. And like I said, there's no, there's no one. Used to be Wallace Fox, used to be another guy in Frog Lake. And everybody just talks. So I don't know. Canada will not. Canada wants to put our treaties to rest. They want us to be like everybody else. But no, we're citizens plus because we own this land. They think they own it, but our, our feet goes from where we stand to the center of the earth. Everyone else, their feet go down, but it always goes home. God put us here. And that's what the old people used to say. The old men that used to stand up in the meetings. So how do you, how do you, if not in an aggressive way, how do you stay assertive to protect our boundaries and all the things that we have left? It's through the treaties. Make the treaties come back to life. There's still a few of us, no, left that understand the spirit and intent of the word, words of the treaties and the worldview of the people in 1877. When they, they, when they paid out the treaty, it was in coins. If you go to Blackfoot Crossing today, you got a good Geiger counter, you'll still find those coins because the trade was just beaver pelts, buffalo robes and whatnot. So all those things that we were promised, they, they just didn't keep it. And today, truth and reconciliation who is reconciling? There's supposed to be two parties, right? Reconcile them and us. But it's only us. And who's getting the bulk of that truth and reconciliation money? It's a therapist. What about our medicine men? What about our elders? They're the ones, the mass law. He, sends, he spent seven years among the Blackfoot. And that's where psychology comes from. So uh, why are we going to them? That's where psychiatry comes from. And then just two weeks ago on TV, it says the governments are missing the mark on indigenous mental health. I, I worked for the government 2000 to, 2004 to 2008. Iris Evans came up with a mental health strategy and they had a wisdom committee that was advising them. And then myself and Alan Beaver, we kind of made a, a pact between us. And we told, we said 
to each other. We're not going to sell out our people. So we had to stay. We had to stay until a, a cabinet uh, quit for the evening. So it was late at night after 11. Me and Alan, they gave us the paper for our opinion. So we put it together. And then it was Iris Evans and a woman called Cynthia Dunnigan that proposed the Alberta Mental Health Strategy. And Alan and I, we told our minister, did they ask for First Nations? Did they actually go to our communities, to our health centers, and ask them about our mental health? And I told them, our mental health is different. You have intergenerational trauma that they don't understand. They never will because they didn't live it. We did. We're the only ones can understand it. So, we, and then some of the people, I'm not going to mention their names, some of the people I know on the, on the mental health strategy, I approached them and I told them, who told you to speak on behalf of your chief and council? Who gave you the right? No one. I said, nobody went to my chief. Nobody went to our health center. So, and then this, uh, so that they passed it anyway. So like I said, the governments don't care how we, how we object unless it's done in a way that you have to chief support. If we can all get the chiefs going again in the right direction, we have hope. But if we, we're just employees of the federal government, then we don't have hope. And our eyes are wide open and it's happening. And I see every day the, the assimilation that John A. McDonald's dream, that devil, is coming true. And then they talk about alcohol, same thing. I tell them, I said, I, I'm, I'm a recovering alcoholic. I said, your programs are not good for our people. What's wrong with your programs? Because our alcoholism is different. But no, they don't listen. So what are we going to do? We're going to keep lying down. We have to get up and assert grassroots authority, like the old chiefs, the old chiefs, the people led and the chiefs followed and done their bidding. So the world is upside down. As I'm getting older, I see this new generation has to Come alive, and only you guys, you young people, can do it. Not me. My time is past. I can do this advice and and pray. I can pray for the for you to see the light, but you gotta look for it. And like I told Autumn, it's you women has gotta do it, and you're doing it. And don't be afraid because it's your children and grandchildren. It's you and creator that have the gift to give life. Us men, we messed it up. 
So the way I speak, it's like, I'm okay with it. Let them criticize me. So I guess the residential schools, you know, I've, I've talked about it. The trauma will continue if we allow it. Like me, I had to quit drinking to put an end to, to that part of my life. So what, how are we going to stop the next part? Is this self-destruction, this implosion in our communities? I'm always proud to be church in I was traveling in Italy one time, and they told me, why don't you call yourself a Sioux or an Iroquois? I said, no, I'm a church in If that's not good enough for you, give me my plane ticket, I told them. So we all have something to be proud of. We all have that warrior spirit that our ancestors gave us. We never feared anything. We understood everything. And that's why the white man is the way he is. He fears everything. While we understand that the process of life and God's will can happen if we uh, help it along. And I admire all you women that are standing up. Take my hat off to you if I had my hat on. But you got to keep going, all of you. You got to do it. Because I believe in you. My time is passing. I can advise, I can help. It's all I have to say. Thank you so much, Bruce. Um, that was great. Thank you so much. I think a lot of people, I just wanted to make people aware that the chat, Jared has been posting pretty much to what everything Bruce is saying. So if you want to open up those links and just have them on your computer to do some further reading and further educate yourself on the Indian Act, UNDRIP, treaty, um, true intent of the treaty, day schools, um, the list goes on. Bruce covered such a huge thing. So I thank you so much, Bruce. Um, I think this is a good segue to jump into the residential school discussion, keep that going. And we'll start with, um, I guess, I think we wanted to start with Yvonne, who has participated in the Bear Clan. So if you want to talk on that. Thank you, Bruce. And we're going to um, still hold questions at the end, and then we'll close it in a good way. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Yvonne and hi. My screen is kind of like a little bit cloudy, so don't mind it. Um, good morning, Tanet Ada, Oki, Nitaniku, Box Kaneskina Nakiaki. My my dogs are just barking. Um so I'm from the Siksika Nation, and my experience with the Bear Clan Patrol Calgary, um, it started in 2019, and there was a call made. Hold on, hold on. Kika. Yeah. Yeah, I'm live right now. There, okay, so with the Bear Clan Patrol, just so like I didn't know Bruce needed to answer that. Um, with the Bear Clan Patrol, we started in 2019 and there was a call put out and Gitz Derange put out a call on Facebook. And there was like, he just said, you know, who wants to start taking back the community? Who wants to help in here in Mokinsis? Who wants to help? And so he just said like, show up at Tim Hortons. He's like, come at Tim Hortons on Sunday at 7.30. So there were seven of us that showed up there that first time. And when, when we went there, the biggest goal is, because I'm a co-founder, so there was Gitz, there was Vignette Wahoven, there was Joseph Boises, 
There was Cheyenne McGinnis, there was James Gus, and there was Heather Black. And so us seven went forward and we said, okay, what does the community need and how can we help? And so we went to our own homes and our first patrol was on November 22nd, 2019. And we started in Forest Lawn because a lot of us lived close to Forest Lawn and we realized that the Indigenous population was settling in Forest Lawn. And we kept it grassroots, just like Bruce said, is that we kept it grassroots and we didn't want to be chief and counseled by anybody. We wanted to be for the people, by the people. And we started patrolling and we got the rights transferred here to Treaty 7 from the original Bear Clan Patrol in Winnipeg. And we had to consult with those um, elders, the Anishinaabe elders and the founders of the Bear Clan Patrol in Winnipeg. And they gave us the manual and they gave us the medicine that goes with it. And they explained to us at that time, they, the James Fable came over to Calgary and he physically handed us and transferred with us. And we had a, a pipe ceremony with Charlie Crowchild from Sutana and we had a pipe ceremony and we prayed and he said, when you're walking with the people and you pray and you ask creator for help, you can never go wrong. He said, Nata, here's everything. Apostituki, here's everything in your heart of hearts. And he said, when you're here and you're taking on this medicine of the bear clan patrol, keep the people in front of and beside of you and in front of you all the time. He said, when bears walk, Bears protect their family and bears protect their territory. So that's kind of like the spirit and the intent of the Bear Clan Patrol Calgary. So with that being said, we've been in operation since 2019. You can follow us on Facebook. We have a Facebook page, uh, Bear Clan Patrol Calgary. We're on Instagram. We're still locked out of our Instagram account. Hopefully, we'll, if anyone has any tips to get unlocked, that'd be great. Um, we patrol, we have patrolled every Friday, even through COVID, even when the government told us we weren't allowed to, even when the city officials told us we weren't allowed to patrol, we continue to patrol and we continue to feed our people every Friday and whenever we're called. So when the discovery of the first 215 elders out at Kemloops, it was, it, it hit home and it was kind of like, for our council, for our volunteers, for our community, when that happened, I was getting calls from our volunteers. I was getting calls from community members that were asking, like, what is the Bear Clan doing about this? Because the Bear Clan in Calgary has kind of turned into, like, the beacon of hope for people. And we love being that beacon of hope because we, in, we involve everybody from the community. Nobody is left um, not welcome within the bear clan. So people were asking us like, well, are we gathering? Are we going to go sing? Are we going to go drum? What are we going to do? How are we going to honor this? Like what's, what's the next step? And so we, we just said, okay, well, where's the most central place? We went to city hall, autumn, put a call out and Kelly, uh, Kelly McGillis from Sutena. She also came. Chantel Chagnon came. Wendy Walker came um pearl white quills came there were like so many people that first gathering and it was like such a last minute gathering but we all showed up and right then and there it was like we brought shoes we brought smudge we brought our own feelings and it affects all of us and that was the message that when we started the shoe memorial we didn't know where those elders came from that were found at the Tekemloops residential school. They could have come from, from Treaty 7, they could have come from Treaty 6, they could have come from any treaty area from 1 to 11. And we just wanted to come together and remind Calgarians that are in Mokginsis that our elders matter, that those children matter. And we wanted it to be like a really stark reminder. And so that's why we just put, we just place children's shoes because when you're leaving the house, I know for my little girl, I would always see her. That's the first thing she would put on when she was going to school is she would put on her shoes and she'd take them off when she'd come home. And we all decided that it was really like a good reminder to put empty children's shoes right at the, right at city hall.
And it was amazing to see that so many people came and so many shoes started accumulating and so many shoes started like being left there at city hall and that lots of different Calgarians were affected by this and lots of different people were moved by this memorial. And then we had a second memorial and we did a call out with the help of Carmen and Kelly McGillis. And that the whole plaza was like full. And this is when COVID regulations came down and they totally were like, you can't gather, you can't have more than 20 people gathering, but there was probably easy 700 people there. It was awesome. And we reminded Calgarians again that our children matter, that our children that went to the residential school, that they didn't come home, that why is this not national news? Like, why did the city of Calgary only put their flags at half mast for like a week or two? Why is it that, you know, when anything help, when anything else happens to other kids that the whole country stops? You know, why is it when it comes to Indigenous kids, Indigenous children, anything that has to do with Indigenous people, it's like, again, we're second on the on on the six o'clock news or we don't even make it there. And us putting that call out again, being grassroots and the Bear Clan committing to work with the with the with the matriarchs of the community to safeguard this site was so important because we work with Sober Crew and the American Indian Movement that has a chapter here in Calgary. They committed to help keeping that site safe. We work with the Crazy Indian Brotherhood. Those men have committed to keeping the site safe even before and after the vandalism. And the vandalism, Audie, Autumn called me and texted me and told me that this happened and I was driving right through downtown. And when I went there and I seen that the shoes had been burnt, it was like, it was hard. And it hit like, it, it hit a place in my spirit that, you know, I, I, I didn't, I didn't know that it could be hurt, but at the same time, it was like that person that did that, me getting angry and wanting to be vengeful, that doesn't do anything. That doesn't serve the memory of the kids. So Autumn was there and she smudged all the shoes again and she prayed and we just took that that burnt piece and we just enveloped like like we put more shoes around it and the city and the city news was there and they were asking us like well why are you doing this like what's the importance of this they're just shoes like aren't you over it yet and I'm like if your kids left one day and went to a place where the government told you you had to send your children and you trusted the Canadian government and the and the Catholic church the Anglican church all these people that are outside of your community come in and say that you can't take care of your kids. You can't look after your kids. They're going to come with us. And you trusted those entities to look after them and they never came home and you never got an answer. That should affect you, you know, and it's heartbreaking because we weren't taught this in school. And I, I truly believe that I hope moving forward that with the city of Calgary and their commitment that the curriculum changes, that the shoes are just a really everyday reminder that, you know, our kids left and a lot of them didn't come home. And my work with the Bear Clan is that we will do our best and we will commit to honoring the memory of those kids. And we're trying to work with the city and get a permanent memorial installed. And I don't even know what that looks like. I have no idea. I have no updates from the city. And we're open to all of community consultation from the indigenous and non-indigenous community. And we want it to be grassroots led. And we want like residential school survivors involved. And we want something that is honoring them. And we want to be able to honor those calls to action as well. And it's not just me, you know, there's like a whole bunch of us that are involved in this and I'm just one teepee pole in the whole teepee that's helping hold the community together. So 
Um, that's my involvement. And if you guys ever want to come out and patrol with the Bear Clan Patrol, you're more than welcome to. We encourage the community to come out. Taylor McNally put out a really good call for mutual aid for the Bear Clan Patrol on her Instagram. And she put it out on her Facebook. And as Jared's pointing out right now, the 60 scoop as well is really good information. And we can share about that as well please look in the chat because there's a lot of stuff that's continuing on with that intergenerational trauma, the assimilation, the colonialism, and the Bear Clan Patrol is committed to actually addressing and fighting all of that stuff and safeguarding our people. And Kelly reminded me earlier, when we're out and we're patrolling, we go to the places that people that live in Mohkintis forget about. And we deal directly with residential school survivors that are houseless, you know, and these residential school survivors, they are our people, they are our brothers, our sisters. And they're a part of them, like they tell us that they're broken, but other social service agencies go there and they want them to pray to Jesus. They want them to pray and they want them to accept that prayer and accept the laying of hands before they get fed. And with the bear clan patrol, we come and we have smudge that's been given to us by elders and we have our drums and we just come and we just walk with them and we gift them the food with no expectations. We just ask for them to eat and we ask for them to sit with us and we, we ask them, how are you? We don't ever assume how they're feeling. And a lot of them share their experiences and they share how the discovery of the children and they, and they talk about the people that they went to school with and they talk about how it all trickles down to today. And they talk about their, about their healing and they really thank the Bear Clan Patrol when we're out patrolling you know, and they, and they, they always, always remind us that we never forget them. And it's not much what we do, but we want to do so much more. And we can't do that without community. And we need your involvement to help this memorial move forward. We need your involvement to not just like and share on social media, but actually come out and patrol actually come out and walk with us. If you guys see that we're doing Christmas hampers for elders, for other residential school survivors that we do every Christmas, donate your canned goods, um, donate your old blankets. You know, if you're doing fall clean out, we accept old blankets. If you want to go and you want to spend $20 at the dollar store, you can spend $20 at the dollar store and drop it off at the bear den. It will go directly to people that are houseless in their own traditional territory. And if you guys have any questions, you can always message the Bear Clan Patrol. I handle all the social media to the best of my ability. I try to answer all the messages. I try to get back to everybody in a timely manner. And I'm only one person out of our whole team that is helping. We have a lot of great allies. And I'm super honored to be able to work with people like Wendy and people like Autumn Eagle Speaker. And I'm super like honored to walk with Kelly McGillis and Carmen and Chance Belgard and, you know, and to have Taylor McNally on our team and all these different community members that come together that just want to support the residential school survivors. And they really want to highlight Indigenous advocacy and they want to highlight Indigenous grassroots initiatives like the Bear Clan Patrol. So if you have any further questions, let me know. That's all I have to say. Again. Thank you, Yvonne, uh, for that. And thank you, Bruce, as well. So I'm going to pass it over to Autumn Eagle Speaker and she'll talk about uh, her involvement with some of the Bear Clan uh, stuff that Yvonne is doing, but also a lot of the activist work that she's doing in the community. Um, and, and yeah, so Autumn. Uh, thank you, Kelly, and um, hello, everyone. Um, um, my name is Autumn Eagle Speaker. Um, um, if you missed the intro earlier, um, I'm from, my family's from the Blood Reserve, which is two and a half hours south of here. Um, and I grew up in the United States, born and raised in Seattle, Washington, and moved back to Alberta as a teenager 
and I've been here ever since. So over 27, 28 years, if you want to do the math. So I was, as I was sitting here too, um, I was doing some other math in commerce, just listening to the conversation that um, Elder Bruce Starley was speaking about and in regards to the signing of treaty. And today is September 21st. Um, so one day, tomorrow is our treaty birthday for the area for Treaty 7, for Treaty 7. And it's the 144th anniversary of treaty. So thank you, Bruce, for speaking about um, the importance of treaty and the, and the importance of continuing to fight for those treaty rights that we have um, as sovereign First Nations people. Um, and that is being overlooked today by a lot of our political leadership. Um, and that's why a lot of um, initiatives um, such as the Bear Clan are important for Indigenous people to remain grassroots. Um, and because of that, um, being that they're not, they're not tagged to the government dollar, whereas they have to do jump the hoops and the hurdles and all of the this and that so that they can get a little bit of funding to do the good work that they do. Um, and so I have so much respect for all of the work that the Bear Clan does um, to Yvonne and to all of the Bear Clan leaders and to our traditional leadership and our elders such as Bruce who keep spending, who keep providing that um, valuable information to our younger generations um, and that motivate um, me as an activist um, to continue on to continue to do the good work. Um, I failed to mention in my um, introduction that one of my many hats, uh, but one of definitely the most important is um, being a mother, which is my involvement, the center of my involvement for everything that I'm involved in, because um, at the end of the day, what affects me affects my children and my grandchildren and all of the future generations, and not only for myself, but for everybody. And so when we're looking at the larger um, you know, issues that affect um, us as a nation, um, environmental, um, social justice, um, you know, it affects us all. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna go back to that pin that Jared had pinned that earlier about we are all treaty people. And it's important for two reasons. One, I don't like it um, <laughs> because uh, this is, I'm going to explain this. Um, I know it's been a, a phrase that's been coined, but um, to say that we are all treaty people kind of gets the other people off the hook uh, from living up to their treaty obligations and their promises. And so by saying that, you know, the First Nations people are the legitimate treaty holders and that we as the foundations of Canadians need to uphold that, I think that that's a better perspective better perspective as opposed to being treaty people. But yes, you live within treaty territory, you benefit directly from treaty and the land that uh, people occupy. Um, and so I know that's a very controversial statement, but it's the truth. Um, so I'm gonna move on. <laughs> um, so, the reason that uh, Kelly reached out to me um, to, to speak today was about the involvement um, with basically uh, Orange Shirt Day and the um, shoe memorial that's currently taking place at City Hall. And I'm reiterating what Yvonne was saying is that um, the city of Calgary has reached out to us group of activists and had conversations about what will be the future of the shoe memorial as they are putting kind of like a timeline on it um, around before like snowfall, like what was what will happen that what's what's the next gonna happen. And and truth and honesty, when we set up the, the shoe memorial after um, you know the second rally uh, for to cut uh, residential schools. Um, we had no idea how large it was going to grow or how many shoes were going to come. And I just want to mention that one of the largest shoe donations came from the Stony Nakota people. Um, they brought in seven garbage bags worth of shoes that I picked up from them and brought down to the site. Um, and so 
when we were just doing this, like my thought was, you know, it would be such a great visual reminder for Calgarians and for Canadians alike, just to see like the shoes. It's just the vast amount of shoes. Because when you say numbers, you say 215, you say 1000, you say, um, I think it's like 3,261 that's quoted um, in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. You know, these numbers really don't mean anything to people because they don't see it. But when you see it and you see it plainly in front of you, then it just hits you in a different in a different light. Um, and so the, the call was to continue to bring more shoes to the memorial to, to add to it. Um, and then we had a series of, um, you know, um, just vandalism. And um, unfortunately, um, the same perspective that we hold about holding truth for our ancestors and honoring them is not necessarily the same perspective as um, many um, Calgarians uh, or non-Indigenous people across Canada, unfortunately. And so, um, you know, and, and, and at the same time, even people within our own cultures are upset because of the things that happened to them through 60s group and residential school and stuff like that, and are still coping with all of these different things. Um, and, uh, you know, we, 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 we grieve in different ways, you know? And um, that's one of the things is that, as in being a caretaker of the site and going down to the shoe memorial, um, it just, we treated the shoes as if they were our own ancestors. Um, and that was the messaging that we received. When I say we, I mean, I'm talking about other activists that worked with me with like walking with their sisters, which in West for the Moxon Vamp Project to commemorate murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls. So pretty much along the same lines about what is going on with the idea about having the shoes there and the sacredness of them. And so going down there, um, everybody, we all clean the site. Um, we smudge the shoes and we pray for um, the victims that have lost their lives to this genocide through these processes of residential schools. Um, I am first generation out, which means that my mother and all of her siblings and my grandparents and my great grandparents attended residential schools. Um, and so we as in our family are doing our best to cope with the intergenerational harm um, and traumas that have come through this legacy. Um, and so we see that played out and through lots of different families and how that works um, unfortunately. Um, but what I want to say is that, you know, people of all different creeds have come to the Shu Memorial to pay homage to the people, to leave tobacco, to leave gifts, to leave art, um, to leave messages of anger, of uh, just anger directed to the churches and to the government. And, you know, and they have every right to be angry. They have every right and they have no outlet. There's no direct outlet for this. You know, it's just, it happened. You know, it was a news blip. And again, like this whole issue of our residential schools, again, it's not all the time. It's not still in your face. Media isn't covering mm -hmm. anymore. All of the uncoverings of our ancestors that are being found in the residential schools. And so now we are over, I think it's, 6,000 um, 6, ancestors graves have been found across Canada and the US. And the most media that the indigenous people are getting is from outlets such as Al Jazeera or other worldwide news networks that are picking it up. And that in Canada and the US it's being suppressed and it's mostly being suppressed because the, gov the media is controlled by um, so many different conservative people that sits on the boards and have ownership of the media these days. Um, and so straight across, you know, we are, we, we live in um, Fox News, Fox Canada, basically, right, is, is what I can say. Um, and and it's, it is really sad. And so now we have this, the, the, the issue with 
what's going to happen and how we're going to move forward. And to be plainly honest, um, in my opinion, echoing what Yvonne was saying, um, we believe that a memorial needs to be put into place within the city um, for Indigenous people, Métis, First Nations and Inuit people to be able to come um, and to grieve and to have a place to honour their relatives um, and to you know, find solace. At, at, at City Hall, there currently is a memorial for fallen firefighters and police officers and whatnot. And that, you know, that would never be a question, correct, right? But they want to put the memorial for residential school survivors in a little tiny place, in a little dark atrium locked away in the middle of City Hall that would only be accessible to people that would feel good enough to be able to go in there. But you wouldn't have to be able to smudge, you wouldn't be able to leave gifts, you wouldn't be able to do tobacco. So there'd be all of these rules and restrictions around it, which again is just more government bureaucratic bullshit. And so so I think that, I mean, it needs to be outside, it needs to come from the grassroots. And I'm really hoping that, you know, we're not like, we don't, have, we're not a group, like we don't have a name. We're a bunch of people that care. Like we are mostly women that have come together, that have stepped up to take on this initiative. We have um, men that are assisting to help safeguard it, but we want to put it out. Um, I'm saying that we should put it out maybe even as a survey to the larger community or a Zoom meeting to say, hey, look, like, what are we going to do? Like as, as a people, as a group together. And I think that's how we're going to move that forward. But I know that to create this, part of that, is funding and money. And so I think that's where a lot of the great people that are on listening into this call can help to assist us in looking for resources or would provide resources. Or if, you know, when you're doing your planning for artistic events that you're saying, you know, there is a myriad of talented artists, artists within Treaty 7 um, that could be given gallery space or that could be given time and opportunity, or that could be uh, reached out to, to join your boards and organizations. Um, because you know we need to get as a group, as a culture out of these individual silos and really start working together to be able to progressively move forward in all of these issues. And so until we get people that are working on the same side, uh, we're gonna still have problems like the vandalism um, at a shoe memorial that is supposed to be dedicated to dead children. And I really like, I'm sorry, I excuse me, but like, who does that? Like who, who burns shoes for little kids? Like, I, I mean, it's, it's, it's so sick to me. I can't even. Um, and so, I mean, I know that, you know, it's going to be a long run to be able to change the perspectives for people to understand um, that this is a necessary thing for the healing of our people. Um, but it's not something that's new. It's been going on for a long time. I know that way back, I want to say 15, 20 years ago, there was a city a strategist named Carrie Nielsen, um, the late Carrie Nielsen, who was one of my good friends and aunties. And she was working on trying to get a sacred space for people to be able to go um, have sweat lodge and have ceremony within the city boundaries. And that was slowly moved forward and then shelved again and definitely shelved after she passed. And so, I mean, there's all of these things we live within the, the boundaries of the city and there's not anywhere that's dedicated for indigenous people, for first nations people to gather without having to pay fees. There's not anywhere for people to be able to go and have ceremony. If you go to Nose Hill, it's full of dog shit and broken beer bottles all over our, our medicine wheels. And so where are we? We don't have much, um, but we have each other. And through these things, we, through these issues, through the findings of the residential school survivors, like it's, we as a people are held in this collective mourning process as each finding keeps happening. And instead of, you know, being shocked by it each time, it's just like we as a people have had to harden our shells and to be able to say, okay, because we know that at each school, they're going to find our ancestors. And 
through the stories that are being shared through our families, even they're not even going to find all of them because many of them were burnt. Many of them were discarded. Uh, many of the nuns and priests had children with the school attendees, and some of them grew up to go to school there. You know, I mean, so this this issue is is, is so huge, um, and 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 it affects me in such a big way because my mom took that school. My mom went to day school too, and I know many people in my lifetime that went to residential school. And I graduated school in 1996, and the last residential school closed in 1997. So I'm just going to leave that there. And I want to thank all of the great work that the Citizen Artist Group for YYC is doing, and for having conversations like these and allowing um, our voices to be heard. Thank you. Thank you, Autumn. Um, that was really insightful um, and some really great reminders for everybody here today. I'm going to pass it on to Wendy and then we'll um, close it for a Q&A. And then, um, yeah, we have a, uh, an abundance of resources that we've just been gathering that Jared has been so graciously putting in the chat. And so we will compile all of those links for the participants and send them out afterwards if you want to continue um, learning more, uh, more self-directed learning. So, uh, Wendy? So one of the things I forgot to do at the beginning, because I was a little bit nervous about this, and um, was to tell you what I call my real name. And my real name in Cree is a Chakas of school, and that means star woman. And I'm learning slowly my own language because we were not allowed to know our language. And so for a lot of us, um, myself, like Autumn, I'm a first generation on my father's side out of uh, residential school. And everything that he learned in the residential school, he brought into his family. And so I bear many scars and I'm so sad to say that I passed on some of that before I knew better to my own children who are working through their um, stuff. So I just really, this conversation is very difficult to have and, uh, and I appreciate everybody showing up for this. Um, also wanted to really support uh, something that Autumn had said, because it's something I've said for a while. And uh, I'm just glad to hear somebody else say it. And that is um, the statement that we are all treaty people has really bothered me for a long time because I've had non-Indigenous people say that to me. And I turn around and ask them, well, what are you gonna do about it? What are you gonna do about being treaty, being a treaty person? What's your, what's your role? What's your responsibility? How are you going to support the Indigenous community? How are you going to change those policies at a city, uh, provincial, and federal level that directly impact us? The city of Calgary, the provincial, not this provincial government, but I heard last night from Justin Trudeau, you know, they, they, they're really quick to throw around words like reconciliation and that they want to do that. Um, but do they? I don't see any action on that. I remember being uh, just before COVID being at a, an event that I was invited to come and sing at. And this uh, sweet little old lady came up to me and um, said how grateful she was that we now had reconciliation in the city of Calgary. And I told her, well, we got a bridge named. That's all we got. We don't have reconciliation. And we're not going to have that reconciliation until the community at large is willing to sit down and listen to us, listen to our pain, the suffering that we go. We have Bear Clan and thank God for Bear Clan and Yvonne and all the work that they do out there. The intergenerational trauma and the poverty that our people live within is horrific. It's horrific. How many of our women and our men too um, go missing? And yet one, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm sorry when any one person goes missing, but it also really bothers me. Uh, I saw the news the other day where that uh, young woman in the United States went missing, was on CNN. Was, it was what they talked about all day. No one talks about our women that go missing or our men that go missing. There's no conversation around that. There's people who say, well, I didn't do anything. I, I wasn't involved in that. I, I didn't. Um, 
I didn't, or, or my ancestors, our forefathers didn't, you know, participate. But you do, you do on a daily basis by supporting the policies that are still there that exist, that happen and directly impact us. Uh, lack of funding, lack of resources. Uh, I know I do what I can in my pitiful way to support Bear Clan uh, by reaching out to people in the community, gathering up stuff, buying toques and uh, getting people to donate coats. And just we do what we can from a grassroots level. And I get it over to Yvonne and, you know, and she and, and the rest of the people at Bear Clan get it out there. I also just wanted to say that on my mom's side, on that Métis side, that um, our, my relative, my first cousin would have been, um, not really well, would have been, I guess he's dead because the Canadian government hung him and that would be Louis Riel. And I don't know how many of you know this, but back in the day before that resistance and that in history is called a rebellion, before that resistance started at Batoche, and I know Autumn, you and Kelly made a journey there. And I was so happy that you guys did that, that you went to where uh, my people fought and died. But that Crowfoot, Poundmaker, and Riel had camp at Sixica. And I, I often try to imagine what that would have been like, these incredible warriors in history who fought for their people and did what they could. When I go down to the memorial for the shoes, I always cry because I think of those babies that didn't come home, those children. I think of them being by themselves, dying by themselves. Were they scared? Were they crying? Was there anybody there to love them on their way out as they went home? So when I'm able to gather myself, I, I drum and I sing to them. And I hope that makes some little difference. Back in the day, because I think it was Bruce, and Bruce, I really want to thank you for everything you said. You're such a, an amazing, I don't know you, but I always enjoy every time when you speak. But you, uh, I think it was you who made reference to uh, UNDRIP. And I remember many years ago traveling uh, to Six Nations, uh, Casey, um, Autumn, your uncle, he was there. And there was another person from Calgary, and I, and I can't remember his name right now. But people came, Indigenous people came. Um, Chief Arvo Looking Horse came, many, many people came. And for the first three days of this gathering, we listened to the great law of peace um, that the Iroquois people uh, wanted us to hear. And then we started meeting in groups to, to give some input. And, um, and that input went to the United Nations to into that UNDRIP document. We need that support from, not only from ourselves, from our own community people who are suffering. And it's hard when you're suffering or when you're on the streets or when you're hungry or when you can't pay rent or when you can't feed your children it's hard to get out there and be an activist. That's why folks like me and Autumn and uh, Yvonne and Taylor and so many others, we do what we can. But we also need our men to show up in a bigger way. Because, and there are some of them that do, but we, we, we need everybody to come. And we need all our non-Indigenous brothers and sisters to support that and to support us. Um, I want to say that recently I was at a um, was invited by uh, the Muslim community. Finally, had uh, an arts event, and I saw some amazing artwork. And one piece that really, well, two small pieces that really struck home. And this one gay, one young uh, female artist, she gave it to me. I, I don't know if you can see this. I don't know if everybody can see this, but it says, "Defend the sacred." And uh, her name is, oh my gosh, um, um, Aicha Lasfar. Uh, sorry, she's really wonderful. But what she wrote on this, because she has, uh, she has an Indigenous man and she also has a, 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 a Libyan resistance leader on there. And she says, this artwork depicts Lakota revolutionary leader Sitting Bull alongside 
Libyan resistance leader Omar Mukhtar, and it is meant to represent solidarity between Muslim and First Nations communities against white supremacy and colonialism. That was pretty powerful. The other piece I saw there was um, this other amazing female artist. She did a painting around uh, four women that she admires and um, and looks up to, and uh, uh, and one of those women was uh, Winona LaDuke. And, and Autumn, I know you and I've met with her and, and you've probably done more with her, but she's a fairly well known indigenous activist in the United States who does a lot. Um, anyways, at this event, um, I did my what, uh, performance and then after spent some time ch ch chatting with different people, um, a lot of folks don't know about residential school and they don't know what happened to our people and they don't know and so part of what I believe my responsibility is as an artist is to, in my own way, to do my best to educate non-Indigenous people as to what we live with to this very day. Like Autumn, I'm a mother, but my children are grown, and so I'm also a grandmother. And I do this for them, and I do this for Autumn's kids. Autumn's got great kids. I love those kids. They're amazing. Um, and I also do this for your children because it's our children who will inherit this earth and what we do and the legacy that we leave behind. It's important. And I'm so honored to uh, be included in this group with Autumn and with Yvonne and to uh, play a small part and to support in the best way that I can. I thank you very much and uh, many blessings for a good day. Thank you. Hi, hi. Ksemaga. Oh, one last thing, one last thing, sorry. Um, well, Autumn, you made reference to Carrie Nielsen. And yeah, I remember her talking about moving on, or, uh, putting that document together to try and get that safe space where we could gather to pray, to have ceremony. Um, I don't know if anybody's ever been or how many people have been to Winnipeg, but Winnipeg actually has that within the city. It's a place called Thunderbird House. They hold ceremony there. Uh, they, you can even sweat there. So um, part of supporting us is us having that place. Other people can go to their churches. They can go to their mosques. They can go everywhere to pray. We still don't have that place where we can go and pray and hold ceremony and be there with each other and heal. So uh, I just wanted to leave that with you. Hi, hi, Simaga. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to, I guess, wrap up the speakers and then we just wanted to leave a bit of time for questions. I believe the time is, we don't like, we're way over time, but that's okay because these are really important things to discuss. Um, so if we want to maybe have like a few questions, if anyone's out there and could be directed at any of the speakers, just be mindful of respect and be mindful of is this a question that is important to this topic or am I speaking just for myself? Because we want to just keep it to this topic. Um, so be mindful of that. So is there any questions? I have a question for the speakers. Are there any other events that people can participate and is, and is it encouraged for non-Indigenous um, people to participate and engage in some of the events that will be taking place in the next couple weeks? What are your thoughts? Um, I guess I'll go into that. Um, I put into the chat because I forgot to mention when I was talking that this Saturday at Olympic Plaza is a Bugex uh, event, which means the children. And so it is put on by the Coloring It Forward Reconciliation Society. And what it is is to honor the past, present and future children um, of our ancestors. And so there is a rally beginning um, at Third Street and 8th Avenue Southwest, and it'll be marching down Stephen Avenue towards Olympic Plaza. 
And then for the day, actually, it's going to be a wonderful day full of performances, of music, dance, and song, um, speakers. Um, we'll have actually uh, Bruce Starlight will be there and Wendy Walker of uh, Women of Songs will be performing. Um, and so there'll be speakers and stuff, entertainment from 11 to 3. And it's really to celebrate the resiliency of our Indigenous people. And so, and of to celebrate our residential school survivors and those that never came home. And so this is a really great way for people to come out and to celebrate and to learn and to participate in that reconciliation um, and doing those, um, you know, personal actions that you can do to educate yourself, to help push forward um, you know, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And so you can bring your family, you can bring your friends out, um, bring your lawn chair. Um, the feature performer is 2020 Juno Award winner, Kaylee Cardinal and her band. And she's also an MC for CKUA, um, a radio DJ, I mean. And so um, it's going to be a wonderful day full of just a great day to celebrate and to great day for us to gather and to, um, yeah, just to gather together. And so I, I wanted to say further that, you know, all of these events too, that are being um, featured about Orange Shirt Day, residential schools, um, First Nations events, powwows, et cetera, that they are great opportunities for everyone to come out um, and to just take take part in these cultural events. Thank you. Um, is there any other questions before we move towards the close the closing? So we have, oh, someone in the chat was saying uh, if, if we can have a follow-up meeting and if they could submit some questions beforehand, I guess that's just so much excellent information to take in and process at the moment. Yeah, I guess we get that. Um, I think that, I think it might be best to, if there's any questions, it could be directed at, um, I guess, Citizen Artists YYC. And then we, as the culture instigators from this um, project can look at those questions, distribute it to the speakers if necessary, and then sort of like maybe bring it back. That's just kind of what I'm saying. It's citizenartistsyyc at gmail.com is the email. It's also in the chat as well. So if there's any questions that come to you, maybe after you want to bring it up and we can be responsible for bringing it to the speakers and then making that happen, making that sort of knowledge transfer um, circular. Um, so yeah, I guess with that, I just want to thank everyone again. Thank you so much. It was really good uh, way to spend the afternoon. Um, yeah, so I will, um, I asked Bruce to, if he could close us in a really good way with a prayer, and then I guess that's it. And if there's any other questions, citizenartistsyyc at gmail.com. Um, you can forward them there. And I want to thank Brandy for being here and being present. Um, and offering her emotional support to anybody if needed. Yeah, so with that, thank you. Well, we're always told to uh, persevere. One of the words of uh, Chief Crawford, be wise and persevere. So I'll leave you with that. Uh, the Kadanan is an honest to say. Dear Takaya Tatle, Nehekunaha, eh, Natsutako, Wusa and the Yet, the Fana, Nisanakola, Nata, a Dikan, the Kadanan is an honest to say. Dear Nehe Natuna, a Dinahon, it ah, a Dikime, a year Hakuna. A hornet, a Dikan, a Sitin, and a sin. So I have to leave. I gotta go to Brockett. <laughs> well, travel safe. See you soon. Can I come? <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you. Nanya Sane. All right, I guess with that, it's closed. Thank you everybody for attending. I hope everyone has safe travels. If they need to travel anywhere, be safe with COVID. And um, yeah, I guess um, I chat and chew happens every month for citizen artists YYC. So just keep uh, your eyes to event bright for the next one. Um, yeah, and we'll see you all again. Thank you. Hi, hi. Thank you, everybody.